we will be talking about geopolitics and the present state of the world, but at the heart of it, despite what's happening in the Middle East uh, and in the Ukraine, is really where the United States and China are heading. Uh, and that's why I brought these two guests here to speak about that and how that impacts us in India and elsewhere in the world. So let me begin with you, Professor Pei, um, and ask you, give us some opening thoughts about the present status of the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, why is it the way it is, and where do you think it's going to go? Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank the host for inviting me to India. Uh, this is my second visit uh, to this beautiful and amazing country. And my last one was 2007. Uh, now, back to U.S.-China relations, you have uh, two images to, uh, 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 to think about. One is the collision of two trains. The other is this downward spiral. I think the first one is far too pessimistic and dangerous. So I prefer the second image. Uh, the two countries are still caught in this downward spiral with occasional pauses. At the moment, we are in one of those temporary occasional uh, pause. Uh, that's because there are really powerful dynamics at work driving these two countries to uh, not necessarily to a collision, but to a state of affairs that would be very close to what the last Cold War was like. Uh, first of all, I think the elites in both countries have concluded that the other is their mortal existential threat. And that is a very dangerous thing to, for each country to think about. And as a worst case, each other's intentions. Uh, the second one is that the process of disentangling the economic relationship is, uh, has barely begun, I think. Uh, it's still so there are a lot of things that need to happen. And these individual events, actions taken by each other, uh, will have a negative impact on their relationship. And third is that the two countries are in an acute strategic dilemma that they are all preparing for potential military conflict. So if you factor in all these three things, uh, the overall direction is hardly uh, optimistic. But there's one positive thing about these two countries that uh, at the leadership level, I do not see that leaders in either capital are interested or are uh, uh, planning for an immediate conflict. There will be shocks to this relationship coming on, but uh, the good thing is that they look into the abyss and they think this is not where they want to go. Thank you. Um, Lisa, why don't we toss you now, where do you see the U.S.-China relationship? How does What are the origins, if you wish, of the present problems and where do you see that going and perhaps what how this will affect other countries? Well, I think that um, what we see is that uh, as China has been growing militarily, economically, uh, it's become more assertive in the region, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region, and th there has uh, been more aggressive tendencies that we have seen with regard to uh, asserting its power and influence. Um, and I think, you know, the goal of China is to undermine U.S. influence and power in the region and to, you know, sort of deny the U.S. access, both in terms of um, sea access, air access, and, you know, this is something that the U.S. Um, is not going to accept. Uh, so the U.S. is um, focusing on a strategy that is building up its partnerships and alliances in the region. Uh, and I think this is actually going quite well for the Biden administration. If you look at all of the initiatives that have been put into place over the last couple of years, um, the first one I would point to is the elevation of the Quad. And this has been a grouping that uh, the goal is to make it the premier regional grouping uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. And this is, in fact, what is happening. 
the four countries are uh, meeting at the summit level every year. There have been dozens of working groups established on everything from maritime security, technology, critical minerals, you name it. Uh, so I think this is succeeding, and we, and we know it's succeeding because the Chinese don't like the Quad. Uh, they call it an Asian NATO. Uh, they say that the U.S. is uh, taking us back to a Cold War era, which it's not. The Quad is not a military grouping, but it is about four powerful democracies coming together, uh, pooling their resources and capabilities uh, so that they can um, shape the future order of this important region. Uh, there are so many other initiatives that the administration has implemented uh, that is uh, building its position in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, of course, China will continue to be influential in this region, has huge economic stakes. Uh, but the point is that the U.S. wants to shape the environment that China is operating in. And it's doing that by building up uh, these overlapping partnerships, alliances, minilateral, multilateral groupings. Another minilateral grouping, you could call it, is uh, the U.S., Japan, South Korea trilateral. And we had a historic meeting uh, between the leaders of these three countries at Camp David in August. There are now military exercises that are happening between these three countries. So the idea really is that, you know, all of these groupings are pushing toward the same vision of having a free, open, transparent um, Indo-Pacific order. And really, that, that's the strategy that the uh, U.S. is pursuing. So, Professor Pei, I know you are a specialist in many ways in the political economy of China. Uh, how much is, the, should, how, what are the domestic drivers uh, in Chinese foreign policy? Because what, what we've, the quad that Lisa has mentioned, as you know, actually fell apart at one point. Australia resigned, uh, and all of the Quad members at different points tried to develop a modus vivendi with China. Said, we don't want to get into a fight with you. Um, and it was largely because of Chinese action, uh, Chinese response, which was basically antagonistic to all four, that drove them back together. And Australia, for example, a country that left, resigned from the Quad, is now internally, from what I've, Indian diplomats tell me, the most aggressive member of the Quad when it comes to China. What were the drivers, or what was the thinking in Beijing that led them to do this? Uh, the, the biggest driver is this uh, sense that since China is now so powerful, it should be accorded with a lot more deference, respect, and its interests should be recognized and uh, given more uh, uh, space. Uh, but this is uh, a demand that other countries find it difficult to accept because Chinese definition of interests is not the same as other countries' definition of interests. So this is the, the, the biggest the driver, uh, hard to see, hard to measure, but it's there. It's this uh, change in framework, how you see the world. And incidentally, that's, I think, uh, that lies behind how the U.S. deals with, how China deals with the U.S. Uh, before, U.S. presence, military activities around China were accepted grudgingly. Now they become difficult to stomach. So that's one. The other, I would say, has a lot to do with uh, President Xi Jinping's own concept of this new world order. And it, it largely reflects his own ideological uh, beliefs, uh, which see the democratic West as much, or, much more of a threat to the Chinese regime as his predecessors. And he also firmly believes that uh, as a great power, China's interests should be uh, should uh, be recognized. So I think these two, and 
individually, you might talk about Chinese military, Chinese state-owned enterprises. I think these things are actually secondary. Uh, the most profound change is really a change of leadership, top leadership. You can see that uh, quite clearly after she came on. Incidentally, uh, many of these changes preceded Xi. I think Chinese foreign policy change really occurred around 2010, but that was much more amorphous, unorganized, uh, lacking a central theme. It's uh, Xi Jinping that brought everything together. So, Lisa, one of the consequences, and you, as you alluded to uh, in the Quad, uh, of China's assertiveness uh, has been a, a, a transformation of the U.S.-India relationship. Um, can you go a little into about how that's now developed, partly because of China, but it obviously has other legs as well? Well, I think we've seen enormous progress in the U.S.-India relationship. And, you know, I think this, the, part of this is just building on what's been happening over the last, you know, 20 years, uh, whether it be Republican or Democratic administrations. Uh, there's always been a focus on building up the relationship with India for various reasons. But I do think that uh, some of the changes we've seen in China's approach to the region, this more assertive, aggressive approach, has definitely acted as a, a sort of boost to the U.S.-India relationship. And I would look particularly at the 2020 border crisis, yeah. which I think was really a defining moment for India and recognizing that uh, China was going to be a problem uh, for India was uh, becoming more aggressive, putting more pressure um, on the border disputes issue. And so, you know, whereas China may have been trying to signal to India uh, not to go too far with the Quad or not to go too far with the U.S.-India relationship, I think the, that border crisis had the opposite impact. And I think we've seen India even more invested in the Quad partnership since then, and more committed to the U.S.-India relationship. And if you look at the uh, Prime Minister Modi's recent visit to Washington, it was an extraordinary visit. There were um, commitments on the defense and technology cooperation fronts, which are really quite historical. You look at the decision to now have the U.S. and India co-produce jet engine technology. I mean, this is really a remarkable development. I can't overstate that. Um, and, you know, the fact that President Biden showed up at the G20, uh, there was a very productive meeting between um, President Biden and Prime Minister Modi. I think, you know, a 20-page joint statement issued um, after that meeting. And what that showed is uh, the U.S. confidence in India as an emerging global leader and as a country that can bridge, uh, bridge the gaps between the developed and developing world. Um, so I think, you know, by all accounts, the, the U.S.-India relationship is in a, a very good place, a great place, I would say. And I think it's partially because of uh, both countries' mutual interest in um, wanting to make sure that uh, China is not successful in sort of dominating the Indo-Pacific region, um, not to mention China's goal of wanting to uh, dominate on the technological front and to control the information environment. Um, that is not in the interest of the U.S. or India. And so I think they recognize that by working together, um, they can help deal with these challenges. And even though, you know, it's not always going to be smooth sailing between the U.S. and India, there are going to be differences. And, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine comes to mind. I think when we talk about China and the Indo-Pacific, uh, there are very much uh, converging interests, and I would even say alignment, on how to deal with that challenge. And so that's certainly contributing to the U.S.-India relationship. So, Professor Pei, the one of the things that, as Lisa pointed out, technology is an unusually strong element today, or, or broader economics, but technology, so strategic technology, 
has become a very important component of both the U.S.-China rivalry, but just geopolitics in the Indo-Pacific and now even in Europe as well. The Quad, in many ways, more than anything else, is a coalition over strategic technology. I think, correct, 28 of the working or sub-working groups, 26 of them are technologically driven. Um, and if you look at China's own policies, their own the, the policies that they have announced, they're very also focused on the need to develop technological leadership in whatever quantum computing, AI, semiconductor chips, of course, has become a, a, a remarkably uh, important issue globally. Uh, how would you, from the, why, how important and why is technology so crucial now to this geopolitical rivalry and to the U.S.-China relationship? Uh, I'm not so a real expert in technology, yeah. but based on my reading is that, uh, my understanding is that we are at the cusp of a technological revolution. That is, you look at a whole range of new technologies that can fundamentally change economies. They can change the future of warfare. They can, they have, uh, they can have profound impact on how we live. Uh, and that's why I think uh, China is really interested uh, and really committed to acquiring these technologies. But the world in which China uh, has gained enormous progress in technology, science and technology has changed. Uh, we should not forget that in the last 40 years, China really came from nowhere, yeah. not to the frontier of tech, not science and technology, but close to frontier. And that's because China uh, had great relations with the most advanced countries in the world. But that world is, is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So the next stage for China is to acquire these technologies, make the scientific breakthroughs on its own, which is very, very hard. Uh, so China has this dilemma. Uh, uh, the old playbook can no longer work. How can it use best use its own limited resources to make the same amount of progress? Uh, nobody knows whether China can do it. Uh, uh, my feeling is that the outside world has overestimated China's ability, mm -hmm. and uh, probably China uh, has overestimated its own ability as well. So, if I have to bet who will win the next technological race, I would say the U.S. and its allies are much better positioned than China is. Right. Well, <clears throat> speaking about U.S. and its allies, I mean, in many ways, this is still, uh, while America has a number of weaknesses uh, on the domestic front, uh, but it has one crucial element that it has a lot more friends and allies than China does. Uh, so, Lisa, why don't you talk about the strategic advantage that America gets out of that, in particular, in comparison to China. And we can see China trying to change that a little bit. Uh, for example, in the present Gaza conflict, they've, they've pulled, they've, they rode very heavily towards the Arab world. Uh, we in India have seen at the G20 summit and elsewhere uh, a bit of a s struggle between India and China over the quote, global south leadership. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, if, uh, Pakistan, in many ways, China's closest ally, uh, has found that there are severe limits to what China is prepared to do for you, especially in an economic crisis. So talking about this, what, where do you see allies or de facto alliances playing in, uh, their role uh, in the U.S.-China uh, China game? Well, honestly, I think sometimes uh, China is, you know, its own worst enemy. And I say this uh, when thinking about the kind of uh, maritime aggression that they've been engaged in, the so-called gray zone activities. And when I talk about gray zone activities, I'm talking about actions that are designed to intimidate, to coerce, but really fall below that threshold of provoking a military response. So China has, has been engaged in these kind of gray zone activities in Southeast Asia, in the South China Sea, where it, it has very expansive and I might uh, add illegal claims uh, to these, these waters. And where we've seen this play out uh, most recently is with the Philippines. And just a couple of weeks ago, there was a collision between the Chinese and Philippines Coast Guards uh, because the Chinese were trying to cut off 
the Philippines who were trying to resupply a small outpost that they have in the South China Sea. And, uh, you know, they have done things like lasering Philippines vessels, you know, blinding the crew of those vessels. Um, also, back in August, they used water cannons on one of these Philippine vessels that, again, was trying to resupply one of its outposts. And so, you know, what has this resulted in? Well, no surprise, uh, the Philippines and the United States are, are drawing much closer. They're really strengthening that alliance relationship. Um, the Philippines has agreed to expand the number of bases that the U.S. can have access to. Um, and this includes a base in the northern Luzon province, which is just about 150 miles from uh, Taiwan. So, uh, you know, you can say something similar has happened with Vietnam, who has also faced some of this Chinese maritime bullying. Well, uh, we now see that Vietnam and the United States have a comprehensive strategic partnership. This is amazing. Nobody could have imagined this just a few years ago. So I do think that China's own actions and its propensity to sort of bully these smaller countries um, has actually pushed them more toward the United States. And, you know, the United States goal is to see that these countries can protect their own sovereignty, their own independence, and that they have choices and alternatives. Um, it's not that the U.S. is asking these countries to choose between the United States or China. I don't think that's what this is about. It's simply to make sure that they have alternatives and, and choices in the matter. So I think, you know, this is what we see happening in Southeast Asia. And, you know, I talked a little bit about um, other alliance relationships that are strengthening um, because of the challenges from China. Um, another in initiative that has come about in the last couple of years is the AUKUS initiative. And this is the agreement between Australia, the UK, and the United States to see that Australia has the capability uh, to deploy nuclear-powered but conventionally armed submarines. And this will uh, ensure that Australia can play a stronger, stronger role in deterrence in the Pacific. And this is very important. Um, the fact is the United States can't um, stand up to China alone. The United States needs allies and partners to do this. And um, I think, you know, hopefully this is something that will last, you know, even if we have a change in administration next year, I think this is a critical point that these alliances and partnerships are so critical for the U.S. Uh, to be able to stand up to China, to take a strong stance. And, you know, when you were talking about technology and wanting to create new technology supply chains, countries like India are critical. And the, the semiconductor issue, I think the United States does see India playing a role in redirecting those uh, t uh, technology supply chains, the Micron investment in a testing facility in India, a semiconductor testing facility, is extremely important. It shows the U.S. confidence in India's role in uh, setting those new technology supply chains. So again, these partnerships, these alliances are critical for the United States. So looking a little into the future, Professor Pei, where do you see uh, do you see any chance of the U.S. and China ever having a grand bargain of some variety? Do you see any real, do you think the present, where do you see the present trends? And if you can talk a little also about China's own domestic economic problems and how that's playing out uh, on its overall foreign policy and so on. Uh, I don't see there's any prospect for grand bargain, that is, they find some kind of uh, fundamental mutual accommodation. Uh, it's just not in the cards. Uh, that could happen if you have a leadership change in China. I think uh, as long as President Xi Jinping is in power, the policies he has put in place 
are very unlikely to be reversed. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, even after he steps down, probably 10, 15 years, depending on his health, the U.S. will not immediately change its approach. Uh, so I think for the U.S., uh, it's really difficult to envision a fundamental rethink of its China policy. Because for the U.S., this is the first time it has a near peer competitor. Uh, and the U.S. does not want to see that. Uh, uh, so, uh, but sort of in the intermediate uh, term, uh, I'm not talking about a grand bargain, but a mutual search for a solid, stable footing. That is, a downward spiral of relationship, leading possibly to direct military conflict, is something both countries want to avoid. Yeah. That's their mutual interest, conflict avoidance. But how to get there is really hard because the dynamics today uh, all point to a crisis uh, mm. sometime in the future, a Cuban Missile Crisis type of situation. Mm. We're not there yet, uh, but uh, it seems to be sort of hard to avoid. And that is, uh, I think, something Everybody uh, in this room, uh, all the people, all leaders in the capitals need to think about because we, the Cuban Missile Crisis did not blow up largely because we were lucky. Uh, are we going to be lucky again? So, Lisa, I mean, taking on this issue of where this is going, what could happen in the future, uh, do you see a situation where the U.S.-India relationship given that China is so important, uh, a strategic glue uh, for that, do you ever see that starting to come apart or changing in a negative fashion uh, in, in the future? Uh, the U, uh, the US India, India China? Yeah, US India U relationship. Sorry. Ah, okay. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, we, you know, it's not always smooth sailing. We, you know, we've had some hiccups in the US India relationship. But I think right now it's uh, particularly strong. And I think, you know, the fact that we uh, have weathered the differences over Russia is, is pretty remarkable. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, we're likely to see challenges in the future. Um, but there is such a strong foundation now between our two countries that, you know, has been built up over time it spans the, you know, the, the partisan divides in the United States. If there's one thing Democrats and Republicans can agree on, it's that the U.S. needs to have a good, strong relationship with India moving in the, into the future. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty bullish on, on the relationship overall. Uh, there, there could be something, you know, a shot out of the blue that uh, disturbs it, but I don't see that happening. Um, but again, you know, we're not going to agree on everything. And I think that, I think that the uh, U.S. administration right now is pretty realistic on what to expect from India. Um, if, you know, God forbid there was some kind of conflict in the Taiwan Strait, um, I think there is realism on India's response. But you may find that there are some U.S. officials who perhaps aren't as familiar with India's um, propensity for strategic autonomy mm -hmm. that may think that that India would, you know, send warships. I, I don't think it would personally. Mm -hmm. I think uh, India would be very cautious if there were a U.S.-China conflict over Taiwan. Um, uh, so I think, you know, that's one thing that, that U.S. leaders need to recognize, that um, India will make its own decisions. India will do what's in India's interest. And, you know, you've even heard this um, idea, and again, I think these are people who don't really understand India, but think, oh, well, couldn't India provoke something with China on uh, the India-China disputed border to sort of distract China in the, in the event there's a conflict uh, over Taiwan. I don't think so. I think uh, India has too much to lose uh, in terms of the disputed border with China. I think there are memories of the 1962 
uh, Sino-Indian War, um, that I think, again, India would be pretty cautious. Um, of course, it would, uh, you know, support uh, the United States in perhaps other ways, diplomatically, maybe even, um, you know, providing access um, to the Andaman Nicobar Islands, something that, that might be useful. But I, I, I don't think India would, would provide, um, you know, military uh, assistance directly uh, or send warships to the region. And I think that's okay. I think that the U.S. understands that India has its own interests and the fact that India shares a long border with China means that India is going to have its own calculations um, in the event uh, that there uh, were to be a conflict uh, in Taiwan. Um, I don't think there, you know, necessarily has to be. And I think this is one of the good reasons that we're likely to see a meeting between President Biden and President Xi in just a couple weeks on the fringes of the APEC meeting in San Francisco. Uh, this is an opportunity. I don't think we're, we'll see any major breakthroughs. And of course, uh, US-China competition is going to persist for a long time to come. But what meetings uh, like this can do is at least um, provide you know, lines of communication uh, so that there are not miscalculations. Uh, and that we can ensure that the competition, the extreme competition, as President Biden has put it, does not devolve into conflict. And that's very important. So, and I tell, I'll just say basically, Nick, I'll just try to turn to some concluding remarks from both of you. Uh, given what is happening geopolitically overall, um, what would be, should we say, what would be your advice to any world leader you met today of how to navigate the, the coming, uh, should we say, turmoil in the international system? Uh, I think you have to exclude some Chinese leaders and you, U.S. <laughs> leaders or okay. put them aside because right. uh, the differences are really too vast. I think for everyone else, including Indian leaders, I think their biggest challenge and the greatest contribution to humanity in the next 10, 15 years is to do everything possible to prevent a great power war between China and the U.S. Because if that happens, I think that will really uh, destroy the future of the planet. Uh, it's j just too devastating, too catastrophic a prospect even to think about. Uh, I think uh, the prospect has not really been thought about seriously enough. I think it's time to uh, think seriously about uh, serious enough about this. So when you say that, I just just add on. So you're looking though at, a, at a, say a Taiwan Straits crisis. Yeah, well, Taiwan Straits right, crisis, which would not necessarily be a major. Yeah, war. Uh, that could I, be I think that's really about the Taiwan Strait crisis. Right. And it's uh, countries like India, American allies, and China's partners. They all have a role to play. They should each time they meet with leaders in China and the U.S. You should say that. You, you guys need to cool your heads. You are headed toward a collision. You have to take a step back uh, and think about the world in which you want to live together peacefully. Lisa, concluding remarks. Yeah, I think I would come at it from a different direction. I would say that given the uncertainty and unpredictable nature that you know we're in in the world today, um, it's it's critical number one that uh, the U.S. remains focused on the Indo-Pacific region and China. This has been one of the questions: Is this crisis in the Middle East going to distract U.S. leaders um, from the Indo-Pacific? And I, I think it's you know very important that this not happen because um, deterrence in this region is so important. And all of the initiatives that I talked about that the U.S. has started in the Indo-Pacific with its allies and partners, including India, is so important to keep those on track, to maintain the momentum as part of overall deterrence in the region. Um, because let's face it, we, we can't afford for deterrence to fail in the Indo-Pacific. Um, you could say deterrence failed in Europe, 
uh, because the Russians invaded Ukraine. Uh, you could say deterrence failed uh, for Israel uh, because of the um, abominable Hamas attacks on October 7th against Israel. Uh, but we can't afford for deterrence to fail in the Indo-Pacific, which means the U.S. has to remain focused on these initiatives that it has been taking and building up this multifaceted kind of deterrence that is already um, in train. And so I think, you know, that that's what I would advise, you know, maintain the focus on the Indo-Pacific and recognize how important deterrence is, because deterrence is about preventing conflict. Uh, you'll he sometimes hear from within the region that, um, oh, the U.S. is provoking conflict, you know, the AUKUS initiative um, and these other initiatives that the U.S. is taking is, is somehow uh, militarizing the region. Well, that's not the case. It's the opposite. This is about deterrence and preventing conflict. Thank you. I think we've got a clear impression. The world is going to be uh, continuing, will continue to be reasonably dangerous. Uh, the game is to ensure that it doesn't get too dangerous. Uh, but otherwise, there's going to be broad continuity on the biggest trends, uh, U.S. versus China, uh, U.S. and India, and I should add India and China. Thank you, everybody, and I'll thank both speakers. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Pramit. Thank you to Ms. Curtis and uh, Professor Pei. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we've closed this session. We will have a short break now. Tea has been arranged in Rani Bagh, which is outside, but you have just 10 minutes to get yourself a cup and then be back here in time. We'll quickly make the arrangements on...